You ready? You say hello. 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 Hello, everybody. This is Blake. Oh. He's come to see us tonight. Say hello. 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 <laughs> Cheeky girl. Okay. Good evening. Um, we are looking at B1 tonight. Um, and the cat is uh, getting involved, I think, tonight. Um, so we're going to be looking at B1, Understanding Living Organisms. Um, before I carry on, um, I'd just like to say, I know this uh, will be watched many times hopefully, um, I've just added up all the views of all the videos so far um, and we've got 633 views of the revision video so far, so that's absolutely brilliant. I do want to keep that up, um, especially like with exams coming up and I'll resend these links. Okay. So we're going to go to screen share uh, and I'm going to put the revision video, uh, revision PowerPoint on, internal display, uh, share, uh, present to everybody. If the cat does come and see us again, I'll uh, let you know. Okay, let's get rid of that. Okay, so... Right, hopefully then, uh, we're going to be looking at B1, as I said, it's understanding organisms. Uh, again, if you um, would like to email at any stage with any questions, uh, obviously this is live tonight on the 23rd of March. Um, however, if you email later on, I can reply, uh, reply to emails, but it won't be on this video. Okay, so understanding organisms. So one of the first things that we look at with understanding organisms is we look at uh, blood pressure and we look at what it is, okay? And what you have to think about is your heart and your vessels are like one big closed circuit, okay? So it's a bit like um, if I um, had a water pump and there was a pipe connected uh, at one end to let the water out and it went all the way around to bring the water back in and I just kept pumping it around and around that's exactly like your heart um, and the vessels now when it comes to B3 that's where you look at the structure of the heart and the structure of the vessels and you should know those uh, inside out which means when it comes back to B1 now this should be fairly straightforward because if you remember, arteries have a higher pressure than veins. And if you remember, I also said arteries, A, arteries start with A, which means it takes blood away, whereas veins has got the word in in it, which means it brings blood back in. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about blood pressure, it's all the blood and the pressure and the force that it exerts onto the blood vessels. So if you think about it, if you pump harder with your heart, you're going to have higher blood pressure. If you pump lower, it's going to be lower. Okay. Now, we need to be able to talk about um, what increases blood pressure and what decreases blood pressure. So what you need to think about is that in the veins, blood pressure is lower uh, because you are further from the beating heart. Okay. And it says they're after the capillary beds, and that's capillaries where your oxygen is delivered. Um, whereas it is higher in the arteries, which are relatively close to the source of the pump, for instance, the heart. So that might be an exam question um, about, so closer to the heart, the higher the blood pressure, the further away, the lower it is. Another thing you might be asked is to think about, well, how do we measure blood pressure? So first of all, you can see this cuff that's put on this person's arm here. And I'm sure lots of you have had your blood pressure taken. And what they do is they pump up this cuff uh, with air so that it really squeezes your arm. Um, and it basically cuts off the, the blood circulation to your arm. And then slowly, they let more air back into the cuff. And then that means as your heart pumps the blood down into your arm, um, the sphygmomanometer, sphygmomanometer, which is the name for the cuff, um, then picks up two readings. So you've got a systolic reading and a diastolic reading. Now what we say normally is that about 120 over 80 is a really good reading. 
uh, to have that's a good blood pressure now i know that i always get confused about well, which one of those is systolic and which one's diastolic and how can i remember that and i have got a way to help you remember but i don't know if you'll like it because it's a bit disgusting if you think about it, when your heart is squeezing, it's contracting, it's pushing your blood out at its highest pressure, and that's your low, so your high number. Whereas your diastolic, that is when your um, uh, your heart, your right ventricles are relaxed, and um, your heart is filling up again. So the way I think about it, with systolic and diastolic, I think about it, it's diastolic is the bottom number okay and if you think about diarrhea diarrhea comes from your bottom so it's the bottom number and also um if you think about it <laughs> you're usually quite relaxed <laughs> and that means your heart is relaxed uh, so that again might help you remember your heart's relaxed and it's the bottom number is diastolic so the bottom number which is 80 in this case is diastolic i did say it's pretty disgusting <sighs> okay so what can affect high blood pressure well generally things like cholesterol if you look at this diagram here you'll see this person um I just had a reminder for tomorrow night's listen uh, this person here has had a lot of cholesterol in their diet and it means it has gone into their arteries and has formed this thing called a plaque p l a q u e and all it is, it's like a, another extra wall inside the vessel, inside the artery. And if you think about it, if you've got a healthy heart, that's how much blood can flow through. But if you've narrowed the gap, the lumen, that the uh, blood can travel through, then it's going to be pushing through harder. And that means it's working under more pressure. So you've got high blood pressure. Uh, the same can be the other way. Low blood pressure can be uh, just as bad. If they also ask you um, what, what, what does it matter if you've got high or low blood pressure? Well, high blood pressure can cause you to have a stroke or kidney failure or liver failure, whereas um, low blood pressure can cause dizziness and fainting because you're not getting enough oxygen around your body. Generally, a lot of overweight people have higher blood pressure, which is a major risk factor for heart disease. Also, lots of salt in your diet can cause um, high blood pressure, which again is bad. So, as I just said, um, now what you've got to be careful of here is people get confused when they're talking about blood pressure and they're talking about uh, diabetes. <laughs> high blood pressure is uh, usually to do with eating either too much salt or too much uh, processed foods um, whereas diabetes is to do with not producing enough insulin and it's to do with sugar levels okay so on to smoking then and um, if you're asked about the chemicals in cigarettes um, and the reason this links in with blood pressure is because nicotine increases blood pressure nicotine is part of a cigarette nicotine is the part that is addictive and tells you that you must smoke you must have another cigarette uh, it can also affect the production of estrogen um, which can be a factor for some women as a result of smoking the function in the heart is affect time will cause permanent damage now, it's not just your uh, heart that's affected by smoking. Uh, you've got to think about your lungs as well. And the alveoli in your lungs uh, can get damaged, uh, and that's where emphysema comes in because your alveoli, alveoli lose their moisture and their surface area. Um, also, you've got uh, something called cilia, which is like hair-like projections in the lining cells of your lungs. And if they get damaged, it means you can't waft the mucus around in your lungs. So all the bits that you breathe in just sit in your lungs and you can end up getting chest infections and smoker's cough and things like that. Okay, so this next part of the topic, I'm just going to check me first of all because... Uh-oh, I'm going to use my hand out. Go Oh, it's looking good, looking good. 
let's just see are we still there yep excellent um i don't know where the puddy cat's gone right let's carry on then i have to do this because it all went wrong with c3 and i have to start again okay so um you may well be asked an exam question about the difference between fitness and health okay now if somebody is fit it usually means that their heart rate returns to its excuse me, normal resting rate um, fairly quickly okay so usually we say a resting heart rate is around about 70 beats a minute so if you have done some exercise the faster it returns to 70 beats a minute uh, the more fit you are whereas if you're healthy we say you are free from disease now it can be microbes pathogens it can be um, mental disease so to be healthy you should be free from disease so let's look at a balanced diet then how can we make sure we have a balanced diet you might be asked about certain um, nutrient groups and what they provide for you you should know the seven different nutrient groups okay however you might be asked to give a definition of a balanced diet it's no good saying uh, you must have the uh, same amounts of all the food groups because that's no good because you're not going to have the same amount of vitamins as you are proteins or carbohydrates so you have to say a diet which contains all the nutrients you need and in the correct amounts so carbohydrates they're broken down into two groups your sugars and your starches so your sugar and um, one of those is glucose your sugar um, if we stored them away can be stored as starch now carbohydrates are used as fast release energy and that's the thing about carbohydrates if you don't use them up they do get stored proteins proteins are for growth and repair okay now think about if you are asked any question about growth um, proteins are made of amino acids what makes amino acids well you need some nitrogens in there okay so just be aware proteins the building blocks of a protein are amino acids fats they are a slow release energy store and again, um, if you have too many of them, get stored on your body. Now, this is an interesting one um, because um, in countries where they don't have uh, very much protein, um, you usually find the children um, look like they've got swollen abdomens. Um, and I must admit, when I first heard this on the news and they said, oh, these children are starving, and I used to look and say they can't be starving because they've got swollen abdomens. Um, but that is because they're not taking enough protein and it means they can't absorb the water. So the water just like stores on the stomach, on the abdomen area, um, and gives them a swollen abdomen. And that is called core. Now you might be asked to work out um, the amount of protein somebody should eat in one day. So, for instance, this is a really easy calculation. And as far as I'm aware, they do give you this. But you literally take 0 0.6 times the body mass of the person. So a 60 kilogram boy should eat 0 0.6 times 60 equals 36 grams of protein per day. Now, I always call these a common sense answers because you're not going to say 36 kilograms, which I have seen some students actually write down. You're talking about sort of two thirds of a bag of potatoes um, if you're talking about that that's a lot of meat so it's just grams right if you don't have enough vitamin C and um, then you get scurvy where like, or you get all bleeding from your gums and your eyes and everywhere it's disgusting uh, and that's the one with the story of the pirates that used to travel across in the sea and they all used to get ill as soon as they took a load of uh, lemons and oranges with them nobody got ill because they didn't get scurvy BMI index. Now, we can normally say, oh, 
Someone just sent me an email saying they can't watch the video and go. If other people are watching it, can you just let me know that you're watching it? Uh, for some reason I can't read. I can't keep going to I can't keep going say it. Oh. Right, Jess um, has just sent me the email. Um, there are some people that are having trouble with safety modes. So what you need to do, if it's on, uh, if you've got a Chromebook, you need to take it into school. Uh, if not, you just, if it's a home computer, you need to take the safety mode off somehow. Uh, but I've had a couple of people have that issue. Okay, um, if we go on to BMI then, um, if you worked out your BMI, so you literally take the mass and you divide it by the height squared, you must square the height, and you'll end up with a number. Okay, and usually it's a number within this range. And generally, we say for someone to be normal, they're between 20 and 25. Below 20 is underweight, over 25 is uh, overweight, uh, and it depends how far overweight um, over the number 25 to become overweight. So, 25 to 29.9 is overweight and then you start going up into the obese categories until you go above 40 which is morbidly obese now these are just general indicators because what the exam board might do is they might ask you um they might ask you um sorry i've just thought of something else uh, they might ask you um what about a pregnant woman or they might ask you about a bodybuilder or something like that because obviously their body mass is going to be more um so you have to be a bit careful there and you have to talk about different dietary needs so the effects of obesity i'm going to just respond to this email uh, the effects of obesity so um it is linked to arthritis where you get worn joints diabetes which is high blood sugar high blood pressure and heart disease let me just some people I'll go to the next slide okay Let me just sorry, send that to Jess. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so the next part of the topic then is looking at microbes that cause disease. And they're called pathogens. Go away. Pathogens. So you can, I'm sure if you've seen like the Yakult advert, it says, oh, you've got good bacteria and bad bacteria. Um, well, in this case, we're just talking about um bad bacteria bad microbes that cause diseases pathogens and there's four different types you need to be aware of so first of all you've got bacteria okay um now bacterial diseases are pretty bad because the bacteria can multiply very quickly um and make copies of themselves and then split and make copies of themselves and split and um, so it means you can have thousands of bacteria in a very short time now cholera is an uh, example of um, bacteria it's usually an infection um, from contaminated water with sewage and um, so this is why when you have instances where there's floods and things like that they do worry about people getting cholera because of like, sewage water mixing in with clean water viruses now viruses are nasty um, because what they do is a virus will go inside your cell so it hides away from the white blood cells and while it's in there it can use your DNA to make lots of copies of itself and then when it's made lots of copies and the cell becomes full the cell bursts and all those little viruses then go into all your other cells and then they do the same again so by the time you've realized you've got a virus you've had thousands of them make copies of themselves which is why by the time you realize you've got um, a cold or the flu which is a virus um, then uh, it's usually quite far down the road um, now the thing is if you go to the doctors and say oh I've got a cold I've got the flu please give me some antibiotics the doctor should say no 
and hopefully you'll realize that's because antibiotics only work with bacteria they don't work with viruses so I'm sure you've seen the advert uh, spreading diseases with coughs and sneezes uh, you must make sure you keep your mouth covered up you wash your hands you put tissues in the bin that kind of thing because lots of diseases are airborne and we breathe them in all the time it's just that our body has got a really good defense system to fight against it fungi now generally fungi are uh, infections that affect your skin on the outside so things like athlete's foot um things like um ringworm is another one uh, ringworm is another one um i remember many many years ago when i woke up one morning i had this like red ring on my belly and i said to my mum what's that and she went ha ha you've got ringworm and i thought what's that and it was from uh, a little cat that we found in the garden many years ago it's not my puddy cat name or puddy cat name is very good um, and all you do is just go to the doctors and they give you some antifungal uh, cream and you just spread it up, put it on and it goes. Um, yeah, so fungi tend to live on the surface. Now the way fungi spread, if you look at this diagram here, you've got these things here called hyphae and on the end you've got spores and it just spreads. In fact, the biggest living organism in the whole world is a fungus. Uh, because it's just spread over such a long way um, that uh, that they say it's the biggest living thing, even bigger than the blue whale. Now this is the one where you're more likely to ask, be asked questions and it's called a protozoa. Now you've got to be careful here because when we're talking about a protozoa, a protozoa is again, it's a microbe and here this is a mosquito. But the mosquito is called a vector because the mosquito is the thing that carries the protozoa. Now, in this case, when we're talking about malaria, the protozoa is called plasmodium. Now, please pay attention to this. Can you see plasmodium is in italics? That means that is the Latin name uh, for protozoa. Okay. Um, but generally the Latin name which we use as the universal language in biology. Um, so this little mosquito here will go along and it will use its proboscis to go and stab somebody to get the blood out of that person because it wants to use that blood for its own life cycle to lay eggs. And the thing is when it goes to a person that's infected and it stabs them then as it sucks in the blood it takes in this little tiny parasite this little protozoa, uh, this plasmodium. And then it will go along and it will sting somebody else. And as it stings somebody else, as it puts its proboscis in again, the um, plasmodium will then go into that person. Then it will go down to their liver and it will use the liver to replicate. So remember, mosquito is the vector. Um, the plasmodium is what actually causes malaria. And it's a type of protozoa. Uh, the other thing, this comes up sometimes, it's always the girls, it's the female Anopheles mosquito. And the reason is, like I said, is because they're looking at um, using the blood for their, um, uh, to be able to reproduce. Um, an exam question that comes up sometimes that says about stagnant water, because the thing is, when this, uh, this mosquito wants to lay its eggs, it finds, you know, when it's been raining and the rain sort of forms little pools of water. Well, if you've got, let's just say you've got, I don't know, a swimming pool and you put a cover on it and then the rain goes on top and forms like a little pool. That's stagnant water because it's just sitting there, it's doing nothing. And mosquitoes love that. So if you want to get rid of um, um, mosquitoes that cause malaria, you've got to get rid of the stagnant water because then they'll have nowhere to lay their eggs. So as I said, vector. Yellow fever is another example um, of exactly the same uh, way that disease is spread. Uh, I've talked about all of those. Right. So, and I've mentioned all of these. Malaria is caused by the parasite protozoa uh, plasmodium, feeds on the red blood cells, 
Plasmodium is carried by the mosquitoes, which is the vector. It is a parasite. Now, there's some words, a lot of these words come up in B2 more than B1. But a parasite is an organism that feeds off another organism and causes it harm. If you've got head lice or ever had head lice, um, then they are causing harm um, and they don't actually give anything back uh, apart from a scratchy head. Uh, right. Okay, so how can we stop ourselves from getting these diseases? Well, malaria is more difficult because they're still trying to find ways for that one. However, there are others that we can uh, be vaccinated against. So you can either have a naturally acquired uh, vaccination. Oh, right, I think Jessie's back on with us now. Excellent. Uh, a naturally acquired um, immunity or artificially acquired through a vaccination. Now, na both of these are sort of similar. Um, in the response, so if I just talk through them, when we say naturally acquired, what we say here is let's just say if you get chicken pox, and you usually do find that um, when children are young, if someone's got chicken pox, then it does spread fairly quickly. Um, and usually, parents aren't too bothered about uh, children getting chicken pox because once they've got it as a youngster, you tend to find that you won't get it again when you're older okay so when you get chicken pox it's a viral infection and what happens is your body um, has got white blood cells and they go along and they identify that it's a chicken pox virus uh, because it's got antigens on the outside and it will make antibodies and the thing is the next time if you come into contact with chicken pox because your um, white blood cells have already made the uh, antibodies once it can make them very quickly again and as I say you tend not to get the disease again so that's naturally acquired whereas if you've got something that's artificially acquired acquired sorry so when I was at school um, everyone had uh, the TB uh, injection uh, which meant you had a small little part of the tuberculosis disease uh, injected into your body and you might think that's a bit weird uh, but all that's happening is with that small amount of and it's usually quite weak or dead with that small amount of disease that's been put into your body your white blood cells see it as a foreign object they look at the antigen realize because it's like an addressable the little antigens um, they see what it is and then they produce antibodies so next time, because TB is an airborne disease again, if you breathe in tuberculosis, your body straight away can produce the um, uh, the antibodies to fight it off so you don't actually get the disease. Okay, now we call white blood cells, um, well, this, is, this is the other way that white blood cells work, um, we can call them phagocytes. Um, and a posh word for white blood cells is a neutrophil. Now a phagocyte, this is another way, it basically changes shape so that it can take the uh, microbe into it and break it down. So I always see it as like the white blood cells are giving the uh, uh, microbes a big hug, but what they're doing is they're hugging it and then squeezing it inside of them and then they can break it down. Okay, so that's it about diseases. Um, like I said, there's a lot of key words in there, um, and there's quite a few in this part as well, the I, and there are certain parts you need to know about. Now, the thing is, you've been told lies your whole life um, in terms of when they say, oh, what are you looking at? Well, actually, you're never looking at anything, because what's happening is light waves are coming along, and they are going straight into your eye and through your pupil which is sort of like a black hole if you like and as they go through your pupil they go through the lens which is just behind it and then they go to the back of your eye and at the back of your eye you've got your retina which has got your light sensitive cells now this is where 
um, you have something called cones and rods. Cones detect colour, rods detect black and white. And I think this is where a lot of this confusion, you know, with this business with the black and blue dress. Um, I do wonder whether it's something to do with the actual retina and the fact that we see something slightly different or whether it's to do with filters. Uh, I don't think anyone's actually come up with a definitive answer yet. So your light waves come along. They go through the pupil, which is the hole in the middle, um, and then go through your retina at the back. Now your iris is the coloured part, and that changes shape depending on the conditions you're in, whether it's light or dark. So if it's really dark, then this iris will pull right back so that more of the pupil is exposed so more of the light can get in. Whereas if it's really light, this iris will um, get like make this pupil really small so even less light can go in because at the end of the day it's trying to stop your eyes from getting damaged. Other parts of the eye you need to know about are right on the front of your eye that covering there just that bit there that see-through covering is called your cornea and that is responsible for bending the light okay now we call that refraction so it bends the light so that it can go through your lens and to the back of your eye onto your retina so there's the coloured part cornea at the front and then just behind the black hole the pupil that's your lens and your lens is just exactly the same as in, a, in some glasses your lens is responsible for focusing the light now we call not the, the light the image we call that accommodation your lens is accommodating the waves and it is focusing them and as I say then it goes back through your retina and then once the image is picked up by the retina then it, the message is sent down the optic nerve to your brain and your brain uh, then sorts out what you're looking at now when you think about animals um, like for instance if you think about humans our eyes are facing forwards and we say if you think about a pair of binoculars we say we've got bi means two, binocular vision, binocular vision, binocular vision. Whereas some have got eyes on the side of the head. And we say they're monocular, mono meaning one. Now, it doesn't mean they've got one eye like Mike Bozowski. It means they've got one eye on the side of each side of their face. And the reason for that is usually it's animals that are prey so zebras, chickens, rabbits, that kind of thing. And they usually go around in little packs. And the idea is if they've got eyes on the side of their head, they've got a good field of vision and they can always look out for predators. Whereas predators tend to have eyes facing forwards so they can judge distances to see how far they've got to run to get their prey. And that's a nice little pretty owl. Hmm. Okay, so... Let's just say you are short-sighted. What does this actually mean? Well, a short-sighted person means their eyeball is too long. So as the image goes in through the cornea, through the pupil, through the lens, and then it crosses over because it's bent, it's refracted because of the cornea, um, it means that the image uh, meets too soon because the eyeball is too long. So what you have to do is you have to put a diverging lens in the way to push the image out so then it will meet the right place at the back of the eye. So if you think about it then, if short-sighted means you've got a long eyeball, guess what long-sighted means? That's right, you've got a short eyeball and the image is meeting behind the eye and that's no good either. So what you have to do there is you have to wear a converging lens to bring the image in much more quickly so it meets at the back of the eye. So the way I remember this is if you're long sighted, you've got short eyeballs, long eyeball, long sighted, short eyeballs, and you have a converging lens. So long con, long con, long converging, short diverging. Now, our eyes are detectors. They detect light all the time. And in our body, we've got nerves all over our body that detect any changes around us. 
Oh, that's okay. Um, now, if you look, you've got in all parts of your body, you've got sensory neurons. Sensory neurons pick up any messages and they take that message to your central nervous system, which is. Oh, someone should subscribe to us. No, sorry. Um, your central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord. Okay, so your. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Your sensory neurons pick up the message, take it to your brain and spinal cord. That then sorts the uh, problem out or response out and then sends that back down the motor neurons to your effectors, which are your muscles. So how does that all work then? Let's just say a little bee landed on my hand. The message would then be sent up my sensory neuron to say there is something on your hand. And the message will go to my brain. And my brain will say, you need to have a look to see what's landed on your hand. So it will make me turn my uh, head. So it sends a message down my motor neuron to my neck muscles to say, move your head. So I'll turn around and I'll have a look and I'll see it's a bee. And then my brain will say, oh, you are in danger. There is a bee on your hand. You must move your hand away. So then it will send a message down my motor neuron to my muscle to tell me to pull my hand away. Now all of that I've just described probably took about 30 seconds, whereas your whole response is less than one second. And that's how fast your neurons work. So sensory neuron picks it up, takes it to the central nervous system. The central nervous system sorts out a reaction, sends the message back down the motor neuron to your effectors, which are your muscles, and then you get a response. So anything, the bee landing on your hand, the sound going in your ear, the light going in your eyes, they are all the stimulus. And what you actually do about it is your response. If you looked at a motor neuron in more detail, you would see that really it's set up pretty much the same as a normal cell, an animal cell. You still got your cell body, you still got your nucleus, and all that's happened is it's been stretched really, really long. Okay, now this part here, this long bit, this is called the axon. Okay, and that's because the electrical impulse has to travel a long way and it has to travel along the axon. And we say it's got something called an insulating sheaf on the outside, um, and that's to help with the direction of the nerve impulse. When the message gets down to the end, then we say this is the synapse, and the synapse is a gap between the end of the neuron and in this case it's the muscle but it can be another neuron and through this gap chemicals are released called neurotransmitters that then set up the next response now sometimes our brain it can't cope with all of the different messages we're getting all the time because if you think about it your clothes are brushing on your skin all the time but your brain has learned that this isn't causing you any harm, so it learns to ignore them. Sometimes though, as well, you need a fast response where your brain doesn't have to think about it. And this is called the reflex arc. So here we're talking about the pain uh, receptors are stimulated. The message is sent down the central neuron to, and in this case, it's the spinal cord. You have a short relay neuron, and then it brings a message back down the motor neuron to the effector. Now the reason for this is it's a very quick response. It hasn't had to go all the way up to the brain to wait for a response to bring it all the way back down um, because it's a quick response to take you out of danger. Now as I was talking about before, the synapses, now this does come up as like A, a star grade questions. So the, this is the neuron here coming down here and this is the end of the neuron and the synapse is this gap here in between. So what happens is as the electrical impulse comes down the nerve system to here, it then sets off these little packages of neurotransmitters, these chemicals that travel across the gap until they get to the other side. They attach to the other side and that sends the message along the next neuron. Okay. Right, we're now talking a little bit about drugs, which is quite a nice link really, because 
neurons and synapses are affected by drugs so for instance if i talk to you about painkillers painkillers actually stop this from happening they stop the message from going across the gap so actually what's happening is your brain is not receiving the message you're in pain it's not removing the pain it's giving your body a chance to deal with it without you actually feeling it so we're going to have a look then at some different types of drugs and the different effects they can have on your body alcohol now usually you will be given a table of data to say about how much alcohol is allowed and isn't allowed and you'll have to work it out because it's measured in units I'm not going to worry too much about it here because like I say you'll be given the information you might be asked to list some short-term effects of alcohol you don't need to know all of these I've just learned three blurred vision impaired speech uh, increased reaction time loss of self-control some people have violent behavior uh, and that kind of thing whereas long term and this is the main one here cirrhosis of the liver long term effects of alcohol mean you can damage your liver because your liver is responsible for breaking down alcohol because alcohol is toxic it is a poison and your liver is constantly breaking it down uh, if you drink alcohol so what happens is over time the enzymes that break down the alcohol get damaged and they stop working and you end up having cirrhosis of the liver it's a really funny spelling look at that c-i-r-r-h-o-s-i-s -I -I cirrhosis of the liver if you're asked for other long-term damage uh, you could say loss of memory and depression damage the fetus you can gain weight risk of diabetes that kind of thing now we talked a little bit about nicotine earlier and the fact that that increases blood pressure but also um, we didn't and I did mention this earlier tar is the brown sticky stuff that irritates the lining of your airways I've talked about cilia um, and bronchitis is another one at emphysema I've spoke about those already uh, carbon monoxide I do want to mention this because this comes up in biology and it comes up in chemistry now we call carbon monoxide a silent killer I'll tell you where this comes up incomplete combustion when a fuel is not burnt properly it produces carbon monoxide cigarettes produce carbon monoxide and the thing is about carbon monoxide they call it the silent killer because when you breathe in carbon monoxide it attaches to your red blood cells now if you think about it the job of your red blood cells is to deliver oxygen well if you've already got a uh, carbon monoxide attached where the oxygen should attach it means you cannot get enough oxygen around your body and that's why they call it the silent killer because it basically suffocates you without you realizing there was a story um, a couple of years ago and it's just so sad um, where a family went camping uh, they had a little barbecue um, and uh, it was quite chilly on the night time so they just the barbecue had like sort of nearly gone out but it's still quite warm so they just put the barbecue just inside the tent uh, zipped the tent up or went to sleep and the trouble is because the fuel wasn't burning properly it was producing carbon monoxide and I think it was a 14 year old girl uh, died from carbon monoxide poisoning um, and the rest of the family were affected but they woke up in time but I just think it's just such a tragedy um, just a little thing as well your grandparents have a look at their fires where the actual gas comes out if it's coming out orange and if they if your grandparents are moaning about headaches or being tired all the time it could be that they're getting carbon monoxide um, poisoning so you must get the uh, gas appliances um, checked out um, yeah so also in cigarettes as well you've got these carcinogens uh, which can cause cancer now, two little words here you need to know about with cancer you've got benign tumors which um, are can divide slowly and they're non-cancerous or you've got a malignant tumor which is a cancerous uh, tumor 
Right, drugs development. Now, if you remember back to C3, I talked to you about how drugs are found and how they are tested. So this is where B1 links in again, and I'm going to talk about C3 at the same time. So you go into the forest, you find this plant that has got this drug in that you know is going to solve everyone having cancer in the whole world. Fantastic. So you take this plant back to the lab, and this is the process you have to carry out. First of all, you crush the plant with a mortar and pestle. You um, put the, uh, the crushed up plant into um, something, a, a solution. I can't think, a solvent, that's the word. A solvent to make a solution. You then use chromatography to separate out and get the chemical that you want. Right, you've got your drug. Then you need to do this. You need to test it. You test it on animals first of all because their DNA is very similar to ours. Okay, we've done all that. Now we wanted to check it out on people. So you have to carry out medical trials. And there's two th that you need to do. First of all, you've got uh, a blind trial where um, the people don't know. You've got, let's just say you've got 30 people. You give 15 people the actual drug and 15 people a placebo, which is like a pretend drug. And then the doctor can study to see who's been cured and who hasn't. What's happening here? Oh, I've got a comment. Um, I'll look at it in a minute. Uh, yeah, so um, the other type of trial is a double blind trial. And this means that the doctor and the patients don't know uh, who um, has got the actual drug and who has got the uh, placebo. That's my book. Okay, so once you've tested your drug, you've got it all right, uh, and you know it's ready to go, then you can go to, um, it's all been uh, checked by the Food and Drugs Agency, uh, they've approved it, and now you can go out to the pharmacy, uh, the pharmacies and the doctors and start selling it. Whole process. 10 to 12 years okay next part of the topic then i think there's two more parts to the topic this one is quite a tough one um and really i don't think the principle is too hard behind it it's the words um your body works under certain conditions like for instance your body temperature is about 36.5 to 37 uh, your water levels have a certain amount, your glucose levels have a certain amount, um, your carbon dioxide levels have a certain amount. And the thing is, um, things happen in your body that make you go away from that set point. So, for instance, um, your body temperature is about 36.5. Um, you go and do some running around and do some exercise, your body temperature goes up. You sweat, your body temperature comes back down. Um, your body temperature is 36.5, you sit in a room, it's freezing cold, your body temperature goes down, you start shivering to uh, carry out respiration, your body temperature goes back up, back to 36.5. And this is what happens all the time, you go hot, you go cold, you come back to normal. And now this is um, you controlling your internal environment. What I've just described as moving away from the control point and then moving back is called negative feedback. But when we're talking about body temperature, glucose levels, carbon dioxide, water levels, urea levels, all of those are called homeostasis, controlling a constant internal environment. Now, the thing I don't like here is the exam board will give you this whole load of information about someone's body temperature and they've got too hot. And then right in the middle, they'll put the question, what is homeostasis? And loads of students then just write, homeostasis is the uh, control of temperature. And that's wrong because it's not just temperature. It's controlling all of your internal environment. So this is just an example where some more key words come in. So let's just say you get cold. OK, what happens here? Um, is 
if you think about it you want to keep warm so your warm blood inside is stopped from going near the surface so you don't lose any heat and that happens because the arterioles constrict and it's called vasoconstriction now the opposite to that when you get too hot is when the arterioles dilate they send the blood up to the surface and then your sweat um, can evaporate and the heat can radiate you must get used to those words sweat evaporates heat radiates so you might think how am i going to remember that then vasodilation and vasoconstriction which one does which the way i remember this is i think about a boa constrictor boa constrictor is a snake that like squeezes it constricts think about that in terms of the blood vessels if your vessel is constricting it means it's stopping the blood flow from getting through so it's stopping the blood from going to the surface and that's when you're cold okay so vasodilation is where it's oh, it's dilated and it's allowing the blood to go to the surface now this came up as a six mark question last year um, so I'm hoping it won't come up as a six mark question this year but you never know so your blood sugar level your blood sugar has to be kept at a constant speed a constant, speed, constant rate because if it goes too high you will end up with too much sugar in your blood and you can end up going into a coma um, and end up dying you don't want that you want to make sure you uh, keep your blood sugar level right if it goes too low you won't have enough sugar to carry out respiration so this is what happens when your blood sugar so let's just say you've just had your dinner okay your blood sugar level goes up and what happens is you've got beta cells in your pancreas that will detect high blood sugar levels and then they secrete this hormone called insulin now insulin is really clever because what it does is it goes to the liver and your muscles because you need a lot of energy there and it takes that simple sugar that glucose and converts it into glycogen now what that means is it gets lots of glucose and sticks them together uh, to make them into a lot of kind of storage area so now all your sugar is stored away in your liver and your muscles and because it's stored away it means your blood sugar level comes down now let's just say it's after lunch now um, and you go for a run around the block okay so you're going for a run and the trouble is now you've used up any excess sugar you had so now your alpha cells in your pancreas can see that your blood sugar levels have gone low and they produce a, a hormone called glucagon now that goes to where all your sugar is stored in your liver and muscles and it takes it back out of storage back out of glycogen back into glucose puts the glucose back into your blood system brings your blood sugar level up now that's quite a tough one to remember um, now there's two ways you can do this you could either draw yourself a little flow chart of what's going on in each or you can just literally copy this turn it over and see if you can recreate it um, the more you can do with this the better um, little simple things I use to remember here is I always get confused with glucagon and glycogen so I think to myself alpha a alpha cells secrete glucagon it's got an a in it alpha cells release glucagon um, so if alpha cells release glucagon then beta cells must release insulin so that's one way I used to remember this is another diagram just to show you what happens with the um, carbon dioxide levels in your blood so normal carbon dioxide levels um, so your carbon dioxide levels go up probably because you've been exercising respiration you release carbon dioxide so that means then your breathing rate will go up so that you can get rid of your excess carbon dioxide bring it back to normal you've got low carbon dioxide levels your breathing rate usually comes down so less carbon dioxide is removed okay right this next part of the topic is looking at uh, genetics and looking at genetic crosses sickle cell anemia is an inherited disorder now if you look here this is your red blood cell can you see how it's a nice disc shape 
and that's because it's got a large surface area, it can carry lots of oxygen. People who've got sickle cell uh, anemia, if you look, this is what some of their cells look like. They look like a sickle that they used to use uh, in farms. Now the trouble is, because of this, it's lost its uh, shape, it's lost its surface area, it can't carry any oxygen, and this actually gets stuck in vessels, and because it gets stuck, it means other cells can't get through, and that's what causes a lot of pain. Red-green colour blindness is also an inherited disease, and if you can't see the numbers on those, then the chances are you are uh, colour blind. Got onto a auxins. No, we'll come back to genetics in a minute. It's later on. Oh, okay, right. In B1, you may be asked a question, and it, I should probably 90%, I would say, the chances are you are going to be asked a question about plant hormones. There is only one hormone you have to learn in B1, and it's called auxin. Okay, auxins, A U X I N. So, how do they work? Well, first of all, a plant cannot make new cells all over the place, it can only make new cells at the tips of the new shoots and the tips of the roots. So how does a plant get bigger then? Well what happens is, you see the sun's coming into this window here. So this plant wants to make sure that its leaves are uh, following the sun as much as it can. So the auxins, the hormones, go to the shaded side of the plant and they cause these cells to get longer. So as they get longer on this side, it pushes the stem over so that the uh, leaves are facing uh, where the light is because it wants the light for photosynthesis. So if you asked about how auxins work, auxins go to the dark side, go to the shaded side, cause the cells to elongate and that pushes the plant over so it's growing towards the light. Now that's called phototropism. Photo means light, tropism means growing towards. Whereas geotropism means the roots growing towards the earth. Now there's some information here on using auxins in weed killers, but like I say, this sort of stuff will come up in your exam questions and I'll um, explain what they want you to do with that. Right, back to genetics that I was talking about just. Okay, so the reason we talked about sickle cell anemia and red green colour blindness is because they are diseases um, that are inherited that you can pass on. So let's have a look then at some of these key terms. Here's a cell. Inside there is a nucleus. In that nucleus you have strands of chromosomes. Now humans have 46, 23 pairs. And on all of those they've got the genes that code for the different features. Okay, so that could be the code for the blood group, that could be for hair colour, that could be for eye colour. Now, if you look back at B3, there's a lot more information about genetics. But what we want to look at is we want to look at genetic crosses. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, some features are caused by the environment, some are inherited. Right, so genetic crosses then. If we looked at genetic crosses, what we're talking about is... Um, if we took dad's sperm, which has got 23 chromosomes in, and mum's over, mum's egg, um, and we put those together, we would make the first cell with 46 chromosomes in, and that is called the zygote. And when we've got half a set, 23, then that is called haploid. When we've got a full set with two in, that's diploid. Now, genetic crosses can help us to um, try and predict uh, what the offspring are going to look like. So, for instance, if you look here, there was, um, and in fact, uh, we could, they call him the father of genetics. His name was Gregor Mendel. He actually was working with these pea plants, and he would take some of the pollen from this purple flowered plant, and he'd cross it with the pollen from this, uh, the egg with this purple uh, flowered plant, and then he'd have a look to see what colour the offspring would be, and he found that they were all purple. 
no surprise there. As soon as he mixed the purple with the white and did it again, he found that they were all purple. And he was like, oh, this is weird. But then when he took the, the purple ones again and did them again, he got some that were white and some that were purple. And he started to realise that there was a pattern. So then they started to have a look at eye colour. And they said, OK, well, if Dad has got brown eyes and Mum has got blue eyes, what are the colour of the baby's eyes going to be? Well, obviously it depends on the crosses. Um, and there is a lot more to this. So please don't go away thinking that you're adopted. Um, but it could be that brown was more dominant. So um, if a brown uh, sperm got together with um, a blue-eyed egg, then the chances are the offspring would have brown eyes. And that's where they started doing these genetic crosses. Okay, so this is what I was on about with the plants. So you can see this plant here is capital T, capital T. That means it's got two dominant uh, alleles. Okay, now there's a couple of key words there. So phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is what it looks like. And genotype is this. It's what the genes are. So in this case, for instance, this one is a pure homozygous because they're both the same and it's two capitals so it's dominant so this is a homozygous dominant uh, uh, plant whereas this one because you can see a dominant and a recessive capital and a lowercase that means then that in there there will be some genes for a different colour um, p uh, plant so if I crossed that with that I could end up with that. Now you might look at that and say, oh no you won't, and you are correct. Because every time I cross that with that, or that with that, or that with that, I will always get um, this uh, dominant colour, but it means this one will be in there. Okay, so... Let's see. <laughs> question that comes up quite a lot is um, how can we predict um, whether someone's going to have a boy or a girl? Well, first of all, let me just say it's a 50-50 chance. Because what happens is, I don't think it's working. No, it's not working. Oh, maybe it's less long. So, let's just Here's the dad. Dads have X and Y chromosomes. Their 23rd pair is X and Y. Uh, some people say it's because they're missing a little bit over here. Um, and girls have X and X. So if dad's sperm, one of them has got X and one of them has got Y. So if we move that down to there and there, and move mum's X, X to there and there, that means this one would be Y, X, so it would be a boy. This one would be X, X, so it would be a girl. This one would be Y, X, so it would be a boy. And then this one would be an X, X, so it would be a girl. So there's a 50% chance of it being a boy or a girl. Do I run out of slides? I think we have pretty much finished. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Now, the thing is with genetic crosses, um, you do need to practice them. But once you get them, they're fairly straightforward. You will find that the key words uh, here, homozygous and heterozygous, they will be in the actual... Um, exam question so look out for those all the clues are in the question and hopefully you're still with me let's just check uh, stop presenting to everyone hey. right excellent okay so that's b1 done tonight uh, we'll do b2 tomorrow night i can go and check out all my emails and comments and thank you very much um, and thank you if you've got any comments on how you want me to improve these please say Cheers very much indeed.